What is up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Cutlass Board Games channel. I am Keith Franks, a board game designer, and I wanted to talk to you about how to play Blood on the Clock Tower without lying to anyone, really. Um, I think this is a really interesting concept because the social deduction genre gets a lot of negative press um, from a very particular type of people that tend to not enjoy lying to people or being lied to. And I think that Blood on the Clock Tower is a game where you can play it without having to worry about these things. Now, to give some context, I did mention earlier I am a game designer. I have actually made several social reduction games, um, two of which specifically deal with this problem because I wanted everyone to be able to play a game that had a trader mechanic without necessarily feeling like that they weren't able to get involved with it if they weren't able to participate in bluffing or lying to people. Um, the first of which is Spirits of Carter Mansion, and what it does is it allows you to negotiate literally anything in the game. You have so much flexibility in how things change. If people are like, hey, um, uh, first of all, like you can just be outright publicly evil. Yeah, I'm on the evil team. This is my goal. This is what I want to do. Um, and then you can bargain with people to change their alignment to join your team in order to win the game and things like this where everything comes down to a negotiation rather than an outright deception. I lied to you, you didn't think about it, you weren't very clever and I won the game is not something that you have to worry about. And then the next one, Spaceship Readout, um, which plays a little bit like Among Us, where you have tasks that you can be focusing on. And it has that same kind of thing where it doesn't matter what team anybody else is on. If I focus on doing my job and solving the thing, I'm able to win the game. And I think that these two concepts are something that we can bring into Blood on the Clock Tower uh, in the way that you play the game in such a way that you are able to enjoy it without having to worry about these things. Um, and the reason why I wanted to make this video is I'm sort of one of those people. For some reason in my brain, when people lie to my face, um, at no point does my brain go, hmm, is this a deception? It just writes down all of the information and then if it's relevant later, it brings it up. Um, later on, like, I played a lot of games and usually the way that I play the game is I assemble every single piece of information that I can. Uh, and if I'm on the good team, I try and narrow down exactly who the demon is. And then I try and use all that information to construct what we call the worldview, which outlines what everybody's role is, puts it all together and then says, this is the demon definitively. Um, and I get very, very good at that. And then when you're an evil player, you do the exact same thing, except you're casting a patsy and trying to make that person look like the demon as convincingly as possible. Having thought about these things a lot, I wanted to put together some tips to help you be able to play the game without lying to people. And if you are a particular player that does like lying to people while playing the game, consider some of these things as new strategies to try. Because um, I think there might be some value in it. Anyway, first thing, um, your reputation is really important as a player, especially if you're playing multiple games with people. And when people get a sense of how good you are or your kind of a play style as a person, it gives an impact on how they interact with all the things that you do. For example, um, I know several players that have a reputation for just doing some nonsense, chaotic things. And when they say and do nonsense, chaotic things, you uh, you become very dismissive of them and then you wait for something to happen that makes you think, oh, this was the important thing, right? Um, or, for example, I'm a player that has played a lot. When I go to the um, regular Sydney uh, Clock Tower event, it's pretty newbie heavy. There's... Um, like the people that run it have been playing for maybe half the time um, that I've been playing it, maybe a little bit more, but I have a lot of seniority and when I come in and I play the games, I'm playing with safety gloves on for a little time, being really nice to people and being pretty gentle about some stuff. But people know, and then I'll get extra targeted about things or I'll be increasingly prone to suspicion and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I think this is really important. If if you are really averse to having to lie to people or being lied to, you can play in such a way that encourages specific discourse that is advantageous towards that. I think that this is the first thing that you would do as a player. You would conduct yourself in a certain way and you'll be consistent in that so that people go, oh, they're always going to do this thing. For example, if you're always going to be a gremlin and do weird chaotic stuff, people go, oh, they're always going to do this thing. 
if you constantly do a no-nonsense thing that helps you in that kind of way where you're just focusing on solving the game, getting the puzzle put together, people will start to respect that and play around that in a certain way. Um, so that was the first thing. The second thing is being consistent in one strategy, um, I think, is especially when you're starting out. Because if you go, hey, I don't, I don't know if I really want to play this, um, being consistent in your strategy means that you're able to get down the core of the game. You're able to get down exactly what you're doing every single time and you're not worrying about somebody asking you a question that you don't have a prepared answer to. If you're an EVA player and then you don't know what you're doing, you don't have a bluff set up, you don't have any of these things ready, and someone goes, hey, what is your role? You're put in this really awkward situation where you have to figure out something on the fly and that can be very stressful for people that aren't good at this kind of thing. However, if you go into the game and you go, okay, on the first day, no matter what I get, I'm going to claim to be the washerwoman, talk to two people, get two pieces of information, go and sit down and then relax, right? Every single game. And then if you're good, you go, okay, I go and find one person, hope to get some information, go to another person, hope to get some information, say whatever, go and sit down, that's fine. Evil person, one of those people is my demon, I get to ask what the bluffs were or whatever. One of the regular person, go and sit down. Um, and if you do that every single time, people go, oh, this is what they do every single time. Maybe I want to give you some information because I think I can trust you because um, they might be a good player that isn't worried about being poisoned or getting killed, uh, like a chef, for example. Um, and then, you know, maybe you get some of the pieces of the puzzle starting out, right? Um, but being consistent in it every time means that you don't have to improvise anything. You don't, you're not put on the spot to do anything in particular, um, which can make things a little bit easier for you. Um, the second one, very similar. You can claim an outsider every single game. You go, I'm an outsider. I don't want to say which one I am. Uh, and then people will press you. They'll be like, oh, is it this one? Oh, is it this one? And you're like, no, I don't want to say it. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, and then whether you are or aren't isn't super important. There can always be an outsider in the game um, in some circumstances. Um, and then on the final day, you can just like come out with whatever you want. Here's my actual thing. This was really helpful or not, but you'll always know your information. Like if you were the fortune teller the whole time, that's fine. You will always know the best to your knowledge, what you think the information is and you can campaign for the person that you think is the demon. Um, but the, the important part is getting through the average discourse with the other players to get to that final day part without putting too much stress on yourself. And being able to have uh, a game plan that is either encouraging discourse that you think you can handle or discouraging discourse so that you can sit, listen to what's going on and get an understanding of what's happening is also fine. Um, I've played with many people that would just kind of just sit there and listen and um, not really say anything, find out what's going on. Because um, there's a lot of stuff to be learned from what people say that they're doing whether it's correct or incorrect, um, what people say other people are doing. Um, looking at things like votes, a lot of the time votes become really, really transparent as to what team people are on, especially towards the end. Um, for example, if every single person, every single person in their town votes for something, that person is a good player most of the time, um, which is, you know, which is why Legion is designed the way that it is. Um, but I think being able to spend more time listening puts less emphasis on you to have to say things that are unprompted, that are unprepared. Um, so the main thing, as a townsfolk, you can win the game as town by solving the puzzle, getting all the pieces of information and putting it together, and then making your best guess as to who the demon is, and then kind of pitching that to the town. That's how I play a game anyway. Like regardless of regardless of what I'm doing, I'm just trying to figure out what my best guess is that the demon is, who I think they are, and then presenting that as best that I can, um, and doing so. On the evil team, your goal is to try and stop that from happening for the good team. Now, the other thing is that if you're a player that feels like you're going to be really, really bad as being on the evil team, there's actually so much redundancy in the evil team that most of the time you can just die and it's fine. Um, if you are the imp, you can first day pretend to be washerwoman, you can pretend to be outsider, whatever you want to do, make up anything, it doesn't matter if it's correct, you probably want to tell your minion the bluffs. Um, and then if you're the imp, you can choose yourself, probably not the first night, but one of the nights, 
and then someone else become the demon, you're dead. You go, damn, I, you know, I was outside, doesn't really matter. Um, and then that's fine, right? And then the minion gets to take over and be the demon, and they get to sweat it in the hot chair on the final day where they're trying to keep the team alive. Um, I've done the reverse. I had a new player that was struggling um, as an outsider, sorry, as, a, as my minion, I was the demon. Um, and they had a, an each night bluff that they were struggling to keep up with. I killed them at night. Suddenly people were super, super convinced that that play was good and that um, smaller cut of information was accurate, which was actually very, very helpful because it was all crap. Um, and then you can do this as a minion. You can go, okay, I'm the poisoner. I'm going to get three nights of poisoning, claim to be something, and then I'm going to ask my demon to kill me. Um, what's really interesting about this is that as a minion that has been killed at night, you're more likely to be trusted. You don't really need to be alive the entire time. Um, and a poisoner that is not present throughout the entire game is less likely to be identified as a poisoner. And then people are going to struggle to find out who the drunk is. Because um, if you just get, like, for example, if you hit a chef on the first night and then you miss twice, but someone else is a drunk getting constantly wrong information and then you're killed, that chef information is going to look really correct. The entire time they're going to think that chef information is really correct and you can use that to your advantage um and that's just an example like most of the time as an evil player you can die and it's not a big deal the demon very often and especially in a bigger game will have a scarlet woman so you die and just it's not a big deal um so you're coming in and trying something and bombing is not a problem um i know a lot of new players have that stress of what if i do the wrong thing everyone will be mad at me it's like no no one's really mad at you not not really um and just trying is obviously fine um the other thing is that for the evil team you win the game like i said by solving the game getting all these pieces of information together in the same way that you would as a good player because if you do something different when you're good and when you're evil it's really obvious that you are not right so keeping that routine trying to solve the puzzle that is the game because that is the fun part of the game in my opinion um and building that worldview and then shipping on the final day. But the difference is that if you are evil, what you want to do is try and find a way where your demon is not the primary demon candidate and try and make somebody else look like the super evil person. Uh, and this can be just really easy as helping emphasize the information that you know that the town has incorrect. For example, if you're the poisoner and you poison someone and they're starting to build their worldview using their information, you're going to know which parts are correct and incorrect. And you can emphasize which parts you think are more important that you know are incorrect to help pull apart whatever worldview that they're building. Oftentimes, if the town gets to the final day and they have no idea what's going on, they will vote randomly and not as a unit, and evil will win. Um, so just in, in just that much away, it's fine. Um, so I think a lot of the strategy of the game doesn't necessarily have to be about bluffing if you remove that part of having to oh my god i have to come up with a bluff i have to pretend to be a character if you just say that you are the same thing every single time and then and then try and solve the game and then on the final day or whatever whenever it's more relevant or there's less downside to you you're able to come out with all of your information and then try and put everything together as best that you can and then an evil player can do that the same way um you can i've i've had games where i've um publicly come out as a minion and it hasn't really mattered that much um because that's the thing if you're outed as not the demon there's not really that much of a downside to it because it doesn't often point out who the demon is um if you're outed as the demon and not executed you can star pass people would be like okay what's next we have to find the actual demon um but i think the if you're if you are the demon and you're playing it quiet and just listening um then you will have more time to figure out do i just sit here do i start passing on the person um and i think there is a lot to the game beyond lying and deception i think that the social deduction genre has has a lot to it um they the Pandemonium Institute often purports this as a murder mystery done differently. And I think that that is something interesting to consider because it really is kind of a whodunit where you are the investigator trying to figure out who the evil people are. 
you are trying to figure out what the murder weapon was, what the culprit was, and where it happened in such a way to convince that the the jury, as it were, um, of your peers as to who the murderer was. Uh, and I think that that's the core part of the gameplay that you should be focusing on rather than trying to convince people whether you are or not the investigator. Um, now, what I wanted to do is have a example setup. This is the example setup. Um, this is a nine player trouble brewing game going around from top left to bottom left clockwise we have the butler the imp the monk the fortune teller the poisoner the librarian the drunk the empath and the investigator and what I wanted to do is I wanted to quickly look at how each of these characters individually in this game could play using um, some of the things I've just talked about so the first one is the butler. The butler has one job. And the one job is to find one person and trust them. And so what they would do is each night they would pick the same person every single time. That's fine. On the first day, you can claim to be the washwoman. Go up and talk to one of those two people um, that the washwoman would talk to. One of them being the person you selected as the butler. Trying to then get gauge whether or not they're a super sneaky person or not isn't really going to matter. You're stuck birding with them, right? Um, but then the information that they give you might mean you might want to choose a different target for the person you vote with or to stick with them forever. And then as you try and put the game together, you're going to change who your master is to try and work around that. Or you can just like absolutely get in someone's pocket. I've done this before. You're like, I'm the butler. I've got no information. I'm just on your train. I'm with you all the way. Um, and that might be picking a player that has more seniority than you or picking a player that you are confident is going to run the game and then just ride or die. A lot of the time, I'll just ride or die and whether I win or lose, it doesn't really matter because some characters, you just have no sway over the win of the game and it doesn't matter, but you might as well trust someone and hope that it works out sometimes, you know, like it's not really a big deal. Uh, next is the imp. So the imp here isn't immediately detected by any informational abilities like an empath, uh, unless if they are hit by the fortune teller. Now, the imp can pass to the poisoner. I don't think that is a big deal. Um, the only time I probably wouldn't... Oh, no, even then, like, looking at this setup now, you have a potential problem where the empath could become an imp neighbor eventually. Um, and like star passing could potentially be a thing, but I, I don't know. I think you could do it, and it, it wouldn't be a huge detriment. Um, I think you could probably ride it out, and it also wouldn't be a huge detriment. Um, and I don't think the other thing I specifically didn't put Washwoman in this, and I picked a game, I play count that I knew would have outsiders in it, so that you could say that you're an outsider or not. So that it kind of it really gently fits in with the things that I've outlined. Um, because I think that it is a play style that will work for most, but I wanted to exaggerate it here a little bit. Um, because I think here, like there's no, you're not worried about hitting a Raven Keeper. You can claim to be a Raven Keeper. It doesn't, all that kind of stuff isn't super important. Um, telling the Poisoner what the bluffs are, and then killing one or two people and then passing, I think is fine. And then trying to solve the game in a way that you make that Poisoner now Demon look good is totally doable. Um, next we have the monk. The monk, you just randomly pick a person each night. It doesn't, I don't think there's a lot of strategy in anything doing the monk in particular, but in the same way as the butler, if you find a person that you trust, you probably want them to stay alive and then you can just keep picking that person. Um, in which case what you're doing is much more mechanical than informational and that's fine. Um, and you don't need to tell anyone that you're the monk. You don't need to do anything. And then if you get to the end of the game and you're still alive and there was no night of no deaths, you can't really be proved that you were anything in particular anyway. So your character isn't super important. Like it has no bearing on it unless if it's activated. Um, next is the fortune teller where you, you get to just sweep and look for the demon. If you find the demon, then you get to go, oh, hey, by the way, I actually had the whole time I was the fortune teller. This is my info. Um, and then you are the backbone of the worldview and you get to put together, okay, this is what I think everything kind of is. And then you, you lead the vote um, on who you think the demon is. Whereas the poisoner is probably the opposite. The poisoner here, if you're playing the poisoner, you can hit one or two things and get pretty good value. If you hit the librarian or the investigator, you get pretty good value. 
Uh, if you hit the investigator, you learn about it straight away. <laughs> like, the investigator wakes up there's one goes, I'm the investigator, that person's the Baron. And you're like, oh, sick, good hit. Like, um, you get to have good immediate impact. Same with the fortune teller, um, same with the empath. If, if the empath is hit by a poisoner, and never again, they'll always be suspicious that it's maybe a drunk. Because um, if they get differing numbers and the neighbors don't change, they're always suspicious that they're, they're a drunk um, or a poisoner. Um, and this would be one of those scenarios where if the poisoner does die at night and then the, the empath got a one and then whatever the drunk role is, like the drunk could be something that is super passive like a soldier. If the drunk's ability is not confirmed to be the drunk, then the empath might go, I think maybe it's me and I just got a really obvious read on the first day or something like that. Um, and then the poisoner dying midway isn't a huge detriment. Uh, next is the librarian. The librarian most likely in this setup is going to see one of three people as the drunk. Um, the drunk, a townsfolk probably, and themselves could also be the drunk. In which case, you're like, hey, this information from these two people, I don't know that I can super trust. But I'll, you know, I'll hear it out. But then there's these other people that have information that I might be able to trust. And then you can focus on them. Um, knowing that what what you are maybe finds good people, maybe doesn't, right? And you can solve the information hoping to hear from the empath or the fortune teller if they are not the targets that you were shown. Next is the drunk. The drunk, when you just say, I'm literally an outsider, is true. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter the information that you could, could give, doesn't matter. Um, and I think as a townsfolk, you can always operate as if you are the drunk, always operate as if your information is wrong um, and only confirmed with one other thing should be counted as true. I'll do this a lot with chef information. If chef information overlaps with any one other thing, I care about it. Otherwise, I tend to ignore it. Um, like, for example, the recluse. The recluse, you go, oh, okay, if there is a pair of evil people, maybe the recluse's neighbors are evil, and then maybe I care about it. Um, or the empath says, oh, I got a one, and then that person died, and I got another one, you go, oh, actually, either the other neighbor is an evil player, or we just scanned over a pair of evil players. Um, and in the mechanical setup of the game and how the abilities interact, there is a lot of evidence to find out what is going on. Um, that is how Bad Moon Rising works. You are trying to assess everything that happens in the game mechanically and then deduce who the demon is. And there is still a lot of that in Trouble Brewing that you can use to deduce what is going on regardless of what anybody has really said. Um, I think that's quite helpful. And as you play the game more and you learn some of these things, you tend to attach them to the information that you get, but it's still really valuable on its own. Um, and then the empath, the empath goes, okay, there's two people in the game that I care about and they're sitting next to me. And then as those two people change, you care about different people and you learn more about them. But getting a zero consecutive nights in the row at the beginning of the game is great because then you can just be like, hey, to my neighbors, hey, yeah, I'm the empath, but you just trust them implicitly for no reason, um, which I do all the time. Sometimes you're the drunk, that's too bad. Um, I feel like being trusting and being wrong is like just not a problem and is a way better way to be than to be distrusting and always wrong. Uh, distrusting and throwing the game <laughs> for your team because you don't want to work with anyone. Um, and then the last one is the investigator. The investigator is literally the I have found an evil person, that person must die. That's so on the tin that you really don't need to worry too much about What's going on? You can get both of those people executed. You have killed an evil player. That's fine. Um, and then you are trying to find out who the remaining evil player is after that, um, which I think works, right? Like you're um, you're given a really important piece of the puzzle. You get to act towards um, building that world view, getting the voting power on board, and that'll build your case on how to put everything together. And I think that um, is really easy and is really cool and is, is pretty good for someone just starting out in Clock Town. But that was kind of what I wanted to talk about because I think that there is a lot to Blood on the Clock Tower beyond just 
lying about what your role is and trying to guess what the other person's role is that they've lied about. Um, I know that the social reduction genre does have this kind of uh, reputation for that being the only thing that there is about it. Um, but there's a lot more to that. In the same way that poker isn't all bluffing, like you see your two cards, you know the cards that are on the table, and your opponent's behavior tells you something, right? If they've folded, they've got something bad. If they're all in, they think that they can win this round regardless of whether they have the cards or not. Um, and I think this kind of information is stuff that you can use in a Clock Tower to play the game regardless of having to worry about people lying to you or not because I don't ever really think about it. It really never crosses my mind. I just see what information I think is important or not. And very rarely have I built an entire worldview around an, uh, a lied piece of information. Often poisoned information is just way more frequent and devastating. And that's just something that happens. Like it's not a, a person in particular choosing a thing that's happened to you. Like they've not lied to your face about something that's going on. Um, that it's just one of the status effects in the game. Um, but that's kind of it. I just wanted to kind of talk about this concept because I think that it is something that needs to be explored a bit more um, so that people don't feel immediately turned off about social reduction games. Because I think that there is a lot of fun to be had in them without having to worry about being put on the spot to improvise something right at the, at the correct moment. Um, but if you are new to the channel, I do have a whole bunch of other Clock Tower content. I'll put that stuff up here. Um, there will probably be one video in particular and then a playlist of stuff because I do have a whole bunch of stuff on here and it's kind of it's kind of worth checking out if you're interested I've got a lot of good stuff that's kind of like storyteller tips um, and a lot of stuff about the gameplay in general to give you an idea of strategy and how things should be put together um, which is hopefully to be helpful about people that are relatively new to the game and trying to figure it out um, so if you do like that go and check it out and hit that subscribe button because that's just really fun too <laughs>